Okay, today we're learning Bracha Mebet. A few announcements. Today's shir is sponsored in memory of Gavriel Ben Noach, Zichrono de Bracha, by Chana and Michael Petrokovsky. Um, if you want to sponsor Shirim, right now it's not all organized on the, on the webpage, but you can donate and send me an email, and hopefully in a few days or a few weeks it'll all be organized and there'll be a system in place. Um, it's a seven and a half year uh, project, so things are slowly developing. I know there's a few kinks in the website, trying to work those things out also. Um, I'll be away next week, as I mentioned, but I'll be posting the posts. I might actually post them all beforehand. Um, I've been pre-recording, so not to worry, there'll be shirim up. Um, I'll be speaking in Teaneck every night, Israel, at 8 p.m. on Thursday. People are in Teaneck, and I'll be speaking over the weekend in Toronto. You can look at Torah in Motion's website um, for the details there. Okay. And just to remind you again, there's a, we want to try to collect information about our listeners and also try to see if there's an opp- an opp- opportunities to develop groups of women getting together either weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, or seum, on a seum basis around the world in different places. So there's already a bunch of these groups that are forming and give us information so we can kind of s- map out where people are and how we can get people together to create Hadron communities. Okay, with all those announcements, we're going to start the daf. Okay, Rav Huna Amar, we're at the very top of Mem uh, uh, not Amar, Rav Huna Achal. Okay, we're going to see a funny kind of story. Starting at the first line of the page, Rav Huna Achal Tlesa Rifte, he had 13 loaves of bread, B'nei Tlata Tlata B'Kaba. Each of them, okay, but these aren't exactly breads, because you can't really eat that much bread, but you could eat that much sweet bread. Bread. You can imagine, right? Every, every, people have sweet tooth. They can eat a lot of food. So he had 13 of them. Each one, tlata tlata bakaba, and has each three of them made up a, a kav, a measurement of a kav, which is uh, 24 eggs. So each one was about eight eggs worth, and that's the size of an egg. Yeah, he ate a lot. The low barich, and he didn't say berkata mazon. Now, why didn't he say berkata mazon? Because we learned about pata baba kisnin. Okay, there's a few different, again, we talked about yesterday. There's a bunch of different interpretations of pata baba kisnin. It could be these little pockets filled with sweet stuff. It could be some flour with sweet nuts and things like that. It could be, uh, nobody really knows exactly what it is. And the word kisnin is a very strange word, not used very often in any other context. Um, that's why the pockets from Kis, that was one, op- one option. Some people think it's just sweet rolls, and that's why, for example, Sephardim don't make hamotzi for Shabbat on a sweet challah, right? Ashkenazim, it's a little hard to understand that, right? Lots of us use sweet challah, but they won't, if it has sweet in it, they won't use it, okay? So, because they think that's pata baba kisni. okay? This is all the famous question, mizonos rolls, right? That's where it comes from, from here. So now we say, so he had all that, and he didn't say Berkana Mazon. Amrle Rav Nachman, another strange statement. Adi Kifna, this is hunger. What exactly he means, this is hunger, okay? So either he said, either he's saying, okay, I'll give you a few different interpretations. The students of Rabbeinu Yonah say, are you really still hungry? You can't possibly be still hungry after eating this, so how could you possibly not say Berkana Mazon? That's one. Rabbeinu Sadi Gaon says, how could, you're never going to be able to take famine because look at the way you're eating. <laughs> if you eat that much food, you'll not, and the best interpretation is the, is the Gaon in, in my mind. He says, you're going to cause famine in the world the way you're eating <laughs> because you're eating everybody else's food, which is very interesting because it's trying to tell you it's, your actions have effects on other people, right? Now, let's look around you and don't just think about your own needs. Um, okay, anyway, he basically, either which way, whatever he's... Whatever this word, this phrase means, what he's basically saying is, how on earth did you not say Berkata Mazon? Okay, so, Ella, kol she'acherim kovim alav suda tzarich levarech. He says, that if other people, and this is again where we go objective, subjective, maybe this isn't enough food for you, even though it's still hard to imagine that it wouldn't be enough food for anybody, but, but if other people determine that this is, now, by the way, kovim suda is used in two different ways. Kovim suda is generally what we say about bread, we're koveya suda on bread. That means, again, now, we don't always do this, although in Israel it's maybe a little more common than in America. You know, everything's eaten with, like, pitot and dips, and, you know, you wouldn't start a meal without all these, all the, you know, that kind of thing, even though, obviously, people do um, eat without it. But the, in those days, for sure, bread was the main staple of the meal. So they would always have a meal with bread. 
which means your koveh suda, you, you have a meal over bread. But koveh suda also, we're going to see, comes up with, means if you have a large quantity of something. It doesn't necessarily mean whether that's the base of your meal, but it means that you're, you ate a lot of it. Okay, and this is where the whole question comes up with pizza. What do we break, make a bracha on pizza? Do you make a mizonot, right? It has a crust. It's not exactly bread, but it's bread-like. So, it, so a lot of people say it depends how much you're eating, or it depends, again, you could, depending on what you say, kovea If you say, this is my lunch, and you're eating only one slice, so if you say, right, maybe you would say, ah, oh, well, this is my lunch, so that means I'm kovea suda. Or you, most people say it's really the quantity of how much you eat. So if you eat one slice, eh, that's not, that's just mizono. If you eat two slices, then already you have to make hamotzi. That's like a big debate, and it comes from here. Rabbi Yehuda have asik le libre. He was busy getting wedding preparations in order for his son. Be Rav Yehuda bar Chaviva. In the house of Rav Yehuda bar Chaviva, because he was, this is actually a source, that he was marrying off his son to the daughter of Rav Yehuda, and he was doing the preparations in Rav Yehuda's house. Remember last time we saw that it was the, the son's side that was preparing the wedding. Here it's the daughter's side. Aitu le pat. So they brought before them, okay, it seems before the guests, even though it's, Seems to be they were preparing, but somehow there's guests there already. So they brought before the breast pata baba, the guest pata baba kissed me. Ki ata sham inu de kamavarche hamotzi. Now he heard them saying hamotzi. Amar lehu mai tzitzi de kashamat de kashamana. What's this tzitzi? Tzitzi, right? Tzitzi is like um, the chirp of a bird, right? I hear these chirpings. Now what is tzitzi? It's from hamotzi. Tzitzi, I hear hamotzi. So what's this tzitzi that I hear? And I was, why on earth are you saying hamotzi? I'm pata baba kissed are you saying, right now, maybe they also weren't saying their brachot out loud, and he kind of heard this sound. So he says to them, are you saying hamotzi? They said to him, yeah, in fact we are. Why are we saying hamotzi? It says in the following, Rabbi Muna Amar Mishum Rabbi Yehuda, Pataba bekisnin mevarchin alav hamotzi ala hamotzi. So here he says, Rabbi Muna says it in the Brayta. Amr Shmuel. Okay, now what's not just enough that he says it because we saw other opinions, but they say Amr Shmuel. Now remember, this is they're saying to Rav Yehuda, who are the characters? They're saying to Rav Yehuda, we say Amotzi because Rav, Rav Muna said this, and Shmuel, who was the rabbi of Rav Yehuda. Remember, first he learned with Rav, then he moved to learn with Shmuel. So they say to him, and Shmuel, your rabbi said Halacha to Rav Muna. So therefore, that's why we said Hamotzi. Amar Lehu, he said to them, Ein Halacha to Rav Muna. Itmar, you got it wrong. It's ain halacha kerab Yehuda, which Shmuel said, not the halacha is like you miss an important word. No, we don't pasuk in that way. Vaha amrele. So then they say to him, Vaha marhu damer. They're still not satisfied. They say, but aren't you the one? Da amr mishmei de Shmuel. Don't you say in the name of Shmuel? Or didn't you say lachmaniot? Now lachmaniot does rolls, but rolls. That are sweet rolls, okay? We're not talking about right, their term for lachmaniot. In fact, lachmaniot, I don't remember it really coming up in Shas lachmaniot. Usually it's kikar, it's something else. It's not lachmaniot. So lachmaniot are obviously some sort of sweet bread, marvin bahen. You can use them for eruv. Remember, for an eruv, you have to put food out, and the food has to, one of the things you put is bread. Umevrachina lehen hamotzi. And you also said that you make hamotzi on these, so don't you say that. So he says, shanehatam de kavasudate alayhu. This is exactly the question about whether if you take these Mizona rolls and your Kovea Suda, right, there's the famous story everybody loves to tell about Rav Aaron Lichtenstein. I'm sure some of you heard the story. If not, I'll, you'll enjoy it. So he was on an airplane and they brought him rolls and he gets up to wash and the, and the flight attendant says, you don't need to wash the Mizona rolls. And he says, no, it's, you know, I wash for this. And, and you know, he was unshaven. He doesn't necessarily come across as a rabbi. So he... So he, you know, he says, uh, you know, I'm going to wash. And she says, well, maybe when you get home, you should check with your rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So now, once you're kovea suda, then you make a hamotzi. Aval hecha de lo kava suda te alayhu, lo. But if you're not kovea suda, then not. So that's the distinction. Rav papa ikli lebe rav huna bere de rav natan. Okay, again, we keep getting a lot of this is a good practical Situation, and it's all a bracha because it goes on every day, so they have lots of stories as opposed to, you know, other things that maybe happen once in a while. So he came to the house of Rav Huna Bere de Rav Natan, the son of Rav Natan. Batar de Gamre Sudatayu, after they finished their meal, Ate the Kamayu Midi Lamecha. They brought something to eat after they had already finished the meal, before Berkhadamazon. Shaka Rav Papa Vika Achil. So Rav Papa takes it, 
and he eats it without making a bracha, even though they had already finished the meal. Okay, now we're getting into a different issue. That's the, we close the issue of Pada Baba Kisling. We're opening the issue of when is it considered the end of your meal? There's a concept that you make a bracha in the beginning of your meal and it covers you till later. Okay, it covers your whole meal. But if your meal is technically over, but you haven't benched, right? You might say, oh, the meal ends when you bench. But we're going to learn that the meal doesn't really end when you bench in terms of your, your first bracha. If you kind of think, oh, I'm done eating, or you, or you do something, we're going to exactly discuss what this is, but there's some sort of indicator that you're finished. Then new food comes out. This is what we call, it's kind of like hasechadad, where you, your mind was on it originally, but you kind of, you didn't really, you, know, you thought you were finished, so now you're done. So your bracha kind of ends. It's almost like your bracha has a, as a, it runs out at a certain point, it's expiration. So then you come back and then you have to, if you have more food at that point, you have to make a new bracha. I'll give you a good example where this comes up every, in, every year at the Seder night. We make at the beginning of the meal a bore priyadama on the karpas, right? The, the parsley or, or um, potato, whatever you use. You make a bore priyadama. Now, if you look in your machzor, most of the machzorim say you should have in mind, and this is the halacha, that your bore priyadama is going to cover your maror later. Okay? Because, now first of all, this question, well, didn't you make hamotzi before the maror? But the maror would be one of these things that maybe isn't included in your hamotzi because it's not exactly something that you would normally eat in a meal. And you have, now, why do you have to have in mind? Because theoretically, you made an adama, it should cover your adama later. But they say because there's this big break in the middle, depending on also how long you do your magid for, you might forget, you know, and you might kind of like, you eat now, and then that's a lot later. So if you have in mind from the beginning that it covers your maror later, then already you've kind of said, oh, this is including all of it. But you have to do that intentionally. That intentionality, it might not necessarily cover it. Okay, so that's a relevant halacha from here. Mm-hmm. What? I think maror comes before matzah. Yeah. No, 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 no. Maror comes after. Yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely we wash first. Okay, and eat the matzah. Okay, that's also this thing that we're going to get to in the next Mishnah, really. Okay, um, about whether it would cover it. That's a whole other question. I don't remember all the details there. Um, but definitely they say have in mind to cover your Adama later. So now we say, where are we? Okay, so he gets to Rav Huna's house. After they finish the meal, they brought food, and Rav Papa just eats it. Amri Leh. So Rav Huna says to him, Lo sara lamar gamar asur milechol. How did you not make a bracha? Don't we hold that? If you finished your meal and you finished your meal, right? Then it's forbidden to keep eating. Amri Leh, you know, with, again, now, what does it mean asur milechol? Without making a new bracha. Amar lehu, si leik itmar. He says, no, that's only if you took away the table. This is a good example. This also connects with Lela Seder. They say, you, you remove the table. Um, where does it, does it come up? Uh, removing the table. Something about, uh, I don't remember exactly. But in those days, they used to recline, as we see from Pesach. And they used to be like on the floor, low down, and they would have these low tables, and everyone had their own individual table. This, we see this in a lot of areas in Halacha. We'll get to it in many other situations. So there's a table there. After they remove the table, that's when it's considered the end of the meal. But they haven't removed the table. It's true we finished eating, but they hadn't removed the table. That's not. So now we say, ah, it's not what we thought that would be benching, let's say, would be the end. No, it's removing the table. And it's not what he suggested, which was just deciding it was the end of the meal. Which is that also have? the origin of men have to leave the challah on the table until Ah, yes, yeah, yeah. So that could be a reason why people leave the challah on the table. I was thinking the challah on the table also could be an issue of dessert, maybe not making a bracha on dessert because the bread's still on the table and we're kovea the meal on the bread. Could be that's it. I don't remember all the details about why people leave it on the table. Okay, so now he says, right, it's only taking off the table. Rabba and Rabbi Zera, another example. This should be Rabba, not Rava with an Aleph, but Rabba with a He. Rabba and Rabbi Zera iklu the Beresh Galuta. Now, a lot of the stories with food happened at the Beresh Galuta because he, was, he had a lot of money and he had a lot of meals. There were always these big festive meals. He would invite people. He was very wealthy. You know, you can imagine diplomatic, right? The way diplomats nowadays. So they go to the Resh Galuta's house, the Exilark, and the Batar de Sliku Tacha. After they took away the tables, mikamayhu. Okay, so they remove everybody's tables. Shadru lehu ristana mi beresh galuta. He sent them some sort of extra food. Okay, it's like, oh, you thought the meal was over. All of a sudden, new food comes out. Rava achil, so he eats without a bracha. Rabbi Zera, lo achil. Rabbi Zera, right, this is classic. Two people, two opinions. 
sometimes three, but Amarle, Lo Savarle Mar, Silek Asormilecho. Aren't you the one who said that once they take away the tables? And this Rubba was the one who said it. So he says, right, did we see Rubba said it? Um, no, we didn't, we didn't see Rubba said it, but he says, didn't you say that Asormilecho? So, Amarle, Ana, Natacha, Deresh, Kaluta, Samchina. Now, here you learn there's a distinction. If you're in your own house and you remove the tables, then it's clear there's not going to be any food. But if you're at someone else's house, you have no idea, and you're, it's up to them. They determine when the meal ends. So if they took away the tables and then they bring out more food, that it wasn't the end of the meal until they determined, mm-hmm. right? Which is very interesting. It's like the way you go to someone's house and you have no idea, right? I remember being once when I was 18 and I went to random people's houses for Shabbatot when I was here for the year. And I went to someone's house and... You know, it looked to me like it was an appetizer course. And like, that was all the food, you know? And, and I, me, this American girl, you know, I was like, oh my God, that's all the food you had. I mean, in general, it was a very poor family. It was a whole crazy story. But yeah, how we got there. And, and you said, no, thank you. Right. <laughs> exactly. And then that was it, you know? So this is the reverse, right? Where all of a sudden they bring you extra food. But when you're at someone's house, you have no idea what's coming. So your intent has no effect on anything, which is really interesting. Uh, now we have other things. There were people who anointed their hands with oil at the end of a meal. Okay, again, it sounds a little strange to us, but it was a custom they did. So if you normally do that, then shemen ma'akvo. Then as soon as you do that, it's clear you're ending the meal. You're not going to eat anymore at that point, right? Especially, you clean your hands off, right? It's like a wipe. Exactly. It's like a wipe in a restaurant. So as soon as you do that, it's as if you ended your meal. Um, uh, I'm a Ravashi. Kiavina be Rav Kahana. I'm Arlan. When I was at Rav Kahana's house, I learned Kigon Anan de Rigilina be Mishcha, Mishcha Ma'akvalan. He said the exact same thing. He, Rav Kahana taught us this halacha that if that's the case, then we go by your anointing. The late Tilchataka call Haneshmatata. But actually, we don't pass him like all this. Ela, ki hadam Rav Bichia bar Ashi, I'm a Rav. We pass him by what Rav Bichia says. Rav Bichia bar Ashi said the name of Rav. Shalosh trifotin. There's three things where one thing happens and immediately after something else. Okay? And then we're going to see the one thing leads directly into benching and it's only that that makes, uh, that determines the end of a meal. So the first thing, these two things, the first two things have nothing to do with this. They're just things that happen immediate, one immediately after the other. Techaf lesmicha shchita. Right after, in the this is the world of sacrifices, they would bring the sacrifice, certain sacrifices needed smicha, where the owner of the sacrifice puts, leans his, leans, leans over like his hands onto the, the animal. The Ramban says this is kind of his way of saying, oh, you take my sins, kind of passing it onto the animal. Um, and immediately after, they would do the shrita. Okay, so that's one. The next one we know already, techef legulat tefillah, right after Ga'al Yisrael, you do Shemona Esrei. We keep going back to that. And techef lenetila yadayim bracha. Now, you, this isn't the Nitila Yadayim you're thinking of. This is what we call Mayim Achronim. Right after Mayim Achronim, you bench. Okay, and because of that, and maybe this is also why they say Asur. Maybe it really is forbidden to eat at that point, because you have to, right after you do Mayim Achronim, you have to bench. Like, that's the way it works. You can't have a break. So, number one, it's forbidden to eat. And number two, that would determine the end of your meal, because right after that, you definitely bench. Anything else, and I think this is indicative. I mean, this happens to me all the time. When I'm eating, and then you're not really sure whether you finished eating or not, you know, something might come and you'll eat something else, especially if you're not eating a, a, a formal meal, right? This happens. You're not exactly ever really finished. Right? You're really finished when you do Brian Machronim. Now, if you don't do Brian Machronim, so then I guess it's benching. And then it goes back to what we said originally, that really it's probably what you thought, which is when you bench. Anything before benching is probably okay. But there's different halachas about if you really decided you're done eating, and then you decide to eat more, that you might actually need to make another bracha on that. Can you speak between the two? Between ah, so that's a good question. Can you speak or not? It's a good question. Um, I'm not sure if they talk about the forb- it's forbidden to speak or not. I don't know. Amar af anu nomal. Now he says, I want to add a fourth to this list. I'm sure there's lots more than just four. But he says, techaf litamidei chachamim bracha. As soon as a tamid chacham comes into a house, he brings blessing to the house. Okay, we're going to see some examples. Shneemar, vayibracheni Hashem biglacha. This is what Lavan says to Yaakov, that God bless me because of you. As soon as you came into the house, blessing came to the house, meaning right, what they mean by blessing here is money, right? I became rich because of you. Yibayit ema, some people say a different, re- a different pasuk mehacha. Shneemar, vayibarech Hashem et beit hamitzri biglal Yosef. Remember, Potiphar's house was blessed because Yosef was there. 
I wanted to think about why these two psukim and what the difference between them is. So one, if you notice, Lavan recognizes God, which is interesting because Lavan we always view as a bad guy, and here he's really in a very positive light. He saw that it was God's giving, God's bringing. The other president is kind of the narrator telling you this is what happened, but not necessarily that anybody noticed it. And I thought that it was interesting that you could think about that sometimes you don't note it many times, right? God is helping us, and we don't really notice it. And maybe the second pasuk is pointing that out. And why pointing it out specifically now? Because that's the whole concept we've been discussing. You can't enjoy anything in this world unless you thank God. It's all about recognizing God in this world. And it's a way of saying, you know, even though nobody else maybe realized it, you know, but, but it was God who was doing this, and that you should pay attention more details in your life and realize that God is, is kind of helping orchestrate things, helping you out. Okay. New Mishnah. If you make a bracha, okay, now we're going to talk, it's again, you have to remember the reality, it's hard to understand exactly, but imagine, I mean, this isn't so difficult, you have a meal, your lifnamazon means at the beginning of your meal, it doesn't necessarily mean before you eat, it means at the beginning of your meal. So if you make a bracha on wine at the beginning of your meal, patar tayayin shel acharamazon. Again, this means, right, we keep having issues. What does it mean exactly after? Does it mean after you benched or before you benched? Here, it obviously means before you benched. Otherwise, it would be clearly another meal. But what it means is you finished your meal. This is kind of like the dessert. And they bring out a port wine at the end of the meal. So you don't have to make a new blessing on the port wine, even though it's a separate section of your meal kind of thing. So, right, imagine the, the way they're describing this is if they had these lavish meals with lots of courses, right? So you'll see even more as we go on. So... And it makes sense in the right in the, those times, even Lala Seda, right? It's based on the they had these symposiums, you know, the Greeks and the Romans, and there were all the you know people got together for these big lavish meals, and it could be that they were discussing meals that were similar to those. You don't make another bracha on another wine. No, you don't say it's over. Ah, if you bring a better wine to the table and it wasn't on the table before, if it's a better wine, then you make katova mitiv. But if it was on the table before, then you don't make a tov amitiv. But here we're not talking about a tov amitiv. That's a separate thing. We're talking about boy pragafen. Your boy pragafen in the beginning covers your boy pragafen at the end. Um, right. The only exception we do is the arba kosel. You know, then each one has its own bracha. Okay, that's a whole. That's another question. Why would we make a separate bracha on each one? So anyway, if you do it at the beginning of the meal, it, it exempts your wine after the end of the meal. This is kind of like a first course, okay? Rashi says they would do like pargiot and dagim. This is funny. You wouldn't really, maybe fish, right? Fish you would have as an appetizer, maybe even pargit, right? Imagine you're at a wedding. There's a first course. So if you made a bracha on that, right? This is the first course before you actually eat, or hors d'oeuvres. Pacharata preparat lacharamazon. It includes any preparat you're going to have at the end of the meal, okay? Beracha la pat, pacharata preparat. When you make a bracha on the bread, it, ex- it exempts you from the preparat. You might have thought it's kind of like dessert, it's a separate course. Maybe the pot only goes on the main meal. No, it covers you also for there. But if you make a bracha la preparat, lo pacharata pat. Well, this should be pretty obvious, right? Because why would it exempt bread? But they're telling you if you made the bracha, you might have thought, because it's bore me name zonot, it may be bread, comes from a zonot, you could kind of say, but no. Beit shamayomrim af loma sektera. Even not even a cook dish. Now it's a little bit unclear what Beit Shama is referring to. Is he referring to the, the the line we just read or the line before that? We'll go into details when we get to the Gemara and the Gemara discusses it. You Yoshvin, let's say we're all sitting around the table right now, okay, just like we are right now. We're all sitting on a table on chairs and we're eating together. According to this, everybody has to make their own bracha. I can't make a bracha to be motzi all the rest of you on a bracha nene. But he sevu, but if we recline together, okay, a different type of meal, there's a difference between, again, this is hard for us to understand, the meals in which they sat were not considered all together. But if we recline, then then we're considered all one group, and one can make the blessing for everybody else. But we're going to get more into this in the Gemara. Let's say wine now. Somebody brings a wine in the middle of the meal. Everybody makes a bracha for themselves. Okay, we're going to have to see later why this is. There's a difference between, the, as we just said, that if they're hesevu, one can make the bracha for everybody. However, when it comes to wine in the middle of the meal, okay, this is going to be in tomorrow's daf, 
everybody's going to have to make their own blessing. And there's a bunch of interpretations as to how to understand the Gemara as to what exactly the reason for all these different, um, or why everyone has to make a bracha by themselves. Achar amazon, but after the meal, and as we're going to have to say, what's the difference in the middle of the meal and what's the difference after the meal? Okay, so stay tuned for tomorrow's class. Achar amazon echad mevarech lekulam. Okay, after the meal, one person can be mozi everybody. Okay, so the port wine that we eat at the end of the meal, one person's mozi everyone. Vehu omer ala mugmar. And not only that, but the one who ended up being the one to take the bracha, and the Gemara is going to explain also in tomorrow's daf that the way the Rishonim understand it is that even if there's someone greater than him at the table, and maybe he should be the one making the bracha, if someone else already made the bracha, then they continue and they make the other bracha. What's this other bracha? At the end of a meal, they would bring out incense to maybe take away the bad smells of whatever was there, or I'm not sure exactly why, but it was a custom. They would bring out incense. Again, this sounds like some festive meal. And he would be the one, once he already had the, was the one to make the bracha for everybody, he's the one who continues to make the bracha on the basamim. Or some people claim that what it means is even though there's someone greater than him, and theoretically we should give him that kibud, well, we, what, since he already started with the bracha, he kind of gets the bracha. There it's a bit of a, and we'll talk about it tomorrow, but a bit of a balance between, on the one hand, wanting to give the, the greater person at the table the honor. On the other hand, once you're the one who made the bracha, that already puts you in a position of strength almost, or and you get to do the next bracha. Could that but, be the salt that you're supposed to have so you don't have bad breath? Um, I don't think there was, this is really a, they would, they would put out incense and, you know, kind of smoke it up, and that's, so that's what they would do. Salt is something else. Thing. Right. That's yeah. for the food. That's for, to help your food, you know, take away your bad, that was to take away your own personal bad breath, mm-hmm. right? Right. This is, I don't know, some, I think it was just probably a custom of like, you know, we're chilling and, you know, this is like, okay. let's bring out some incense. I'm thinking of like people who sometimes, right, bring out cigars or something, you know, it's almost like that kind of a thing, Right. Even though they don't bring it, now Rashi says this is very interesting. Even though they only bring it after Berkat Amazon, Rashi says, he's still, in other words, we're still in the same, there's almost, even though we're saying Berkat Amazon is the cutoff, according to Rashi anyway, the understands is after benching, we still connect it somehow. Again, it's not for the issue of were you Yotze, it's just you were the one who made that bracha, well, you, continue, you can continue to make the bracha after you're done. Okay, the Gemara starts off. Amar Rabba. Okay, uh, Rabbi Barbar Khan, I'm Rabbi Yochanan. So if you look at the sheet, I kind of, I, I charted out the Mishnah, but then I'm, I'm, we're going back to the very first line, so you can look back at the sheet. It's, Beracha layayin shalifnei amazon, patar teayin shalachar amazon. The wine from the beginning of the meal extends to the wine from the end of the meal. So he says, Lo shanu ela b'shabatot v'yamim tovim. Ho'il v'adam kovea sudato alayayin. Again, we're back to this kviat suda. In this case, what does kviat suda mean? You generally drink a lot of wine on Shabbat and Yom Tov. So when you drink a lot of wine on Shabbat and Yom Tov, and the expectation is that you're going to bring out a port wine for dessert, then your wine in the beginning is going to cover your wine at the end. Aval b'shar but if it's a regular day where you don't generally do that, then mevarech al kol kos v'kos. Then when you bring wine at the end of the meal, you have to make a separate bracha because your wine in the beginning, you weren't expecting that that was going to happen. Itmar nami amar Rabbi Bameri amar Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. He says the same thing. Lo shanu ela b'shabatot v'yamim tovim. But he adds two more things. Other situations, and, and one can kind of fill in the blank with whatever their situation would be. U'b'sha'ash adam yotze mi beit hamerchatz. When you come out of the bathhouse, it was a time that people generally drank a lot of wine. Maybe they're more relaxed. I don't know. U'b'sha'at hakazat dam, or maybe also for health reasons. Right? We learned all these things about after they did the bloodletting, they would do all sorts of things after for health reasons. Like they thought it was important to drink wine after they did bloodletting, and maybe also the beit hamerchatz. Because in those situations, people drink a lot of wine. So again, you wouldn't need to make a blessing. That's what the Mishnah would be referring to. Aval, but in all of the days of the year, just remember that Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi said this because we're going to go back to him soon. Rabbi, again, we have a scenario. He came to Rabbi's house on a regular day. So we saw that he blessed the wine at the beginning of the meal, and he blessed on the wine at the end of the meal. Oh, good that you did that, right? It's nice. These rabbis kind of pat them each other on the back. Nice job. And that's also what Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi said. Rabbi Yitzchak bar Yosef ikle lebe abaye. Rabbi Yitzchak, now another scenario, comes to the house of Abaye. Be Yom Tov. Dafka an Yom Tov. Chaz yid dibarech akol kasa bekasa. But now the reverse happens. He sees, he makes a bracha on every cup on Yom Tov when you're not supposed to. 
It's not exactly the reverse of the previous case. It's just that was called this is Shabbat. Here he's doing against what we said. Don't you hold like Rabbi Shobh and Levi? That's why I said, remember, he's the one who appears there. Okay, who says, on Shabbat and Yom Tov, you don't make a new bracha. He said, I thought I was done. Okay, again, we see your own subjective. I thought I was finished. I wasn't planning to drink any more wine. And then I saw the wine. It came out, a new wine. I said, ah, I'll drink the wine. But I wasn't really planning to, so because of that, I made a break, and that's why I made my own bracha. Question is asked. Okay, our scenario we discussed before was wine before the meal, meaning really at the beginning of the meal which covered your wine at the end of the meal. What about wine in the middle of the meal? Let's say you didn't have wine in the beginning of the meal. Your wine was brought to you in the middle of the meal. You made a bracha there. Would it exempt your bracha at the end? Now, why you think, what's the difference? But well, we'll see. If you want to say, in the scenario we learned, the case that we learned about before, covering after, is Mishum Dezelishtot Vezelishtot. Because what's the purpose of the wine in the beginning of the meal? It's just for the purposes of drinking wine. What's the purpose of wine at the end of the meal? Also for the purposes of drinking wine. Now you might say, what other reason would you drink wine? We'll see. You have to remember, in those days, they didn't have Coca-Cola, they didn't have iced tea, you know, they didn't have all these drinks that we normally eat and drink during our meals. It was either water, they do have May Peyrot, they talk about, but their main staple was wine. That was what they drank during their meal. It was very diluted, though. It was very diluted. Aval hacha, dezelishtot, vezelishrot, lo. But here, in the middle of the meal, and at the end of the meal, why are you drinking the wine? To drink. But in the middle of the meal, you're drinking it to help your food go down. That's why you drink water in a meal, right? And it's not the only reason why you drink water. But, you know, your, your mouth gets dry from all the food. So the wine in the middle of the meal is coming for a different purpose. This is very interesting. So if the purpose of drinking wine is different, maybe it doesn't exempt the other wine. Which is a very interesting thought, right? That you could be eating things for different reasons and then it wouldn't cover it. Odilma loshna. Or do we say, no, it doesn't really make a difference, right? This isn't a factor at all. So Rav Amar, now, so you're expecting an answer, right? Well, here goes. Rav Amar Poter, Rav says it exempts the wine anyway. Rav Khan Amar, a no Poter, it doesn't. Rav Nachman Amar Poter, Rav Sheshad Amar, a no Poter. We're going to see that there was a number of machlokot about this. Rav Huna, Rav Yehuda, Rachol Tamidei de Rav Amre, a no Poter. Okay, so we split, it's very interesting. All these students of Rav said different than Rav himself. Rav said Poter, but all his students said a no Poter. So you have a breakdown, and it's not so clear where you go with this about how we view wine in the middle of a meal. Could it exempt your wine at the end of a meal? Now we're going to go, so now what did Rav Nachman say? Rav Nachman said, you can also look at the chart here, at the sheet. Rav Nachman says, poter. Okay, just like Rav, but here it happens to be, Rav is asking Rav Nachman a question about his opinion. That you said it exempted. But he says, look at our Mishnah. What does our Mishnah say? Balaim yayim betoch hamazon. Now, notice what it said here. Now, the topic of the Mishnah, of this idea of the Mishnah, isn't the relevant part, but what do you see from here? If wine came in the middle of a meal, everybody says their own bracha. But if the wine then comes at the end of the meal, one makes the bracha for everybody. Now, it sounds like what? It sounds like... They have to make a new blessing when they get to the end of their meal. You follow? It's, it, 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 you can read the Mishnah two ways, and the Gemara is going to say we read it differently. But the first way he reads it is, it's describing a scenario that first they got wine in the middle of the meal, and then everybody made their own blessing. And when the wine came now at the end of the meal, one was able to cover it for everybody. So it sounds like right? they, had to, they made a separate blessing. So Amar Leh, Hachi Kamar, says, no, no, you read it wrong. It's not describing one scenario that followed another. It's saying, if the wine came in the middle of the meal, everyone would have to make their own bracha. If the wine comes at the end of the meal, meaning, and you didn't have wine in the middle of the meal, then one would be able to make the bracha for everybody, in which case this has nothing to do with our topic and it doesn't prove anything. So therefore, there's no question on Rav Nachman. Okay, so remember, if you make a bracha on the pot, it is, we have two lines here. It's important to keep in mind the two lines. Okay, the first line is, you made a bracha on the pot. Okay, it covers, what? Yeah, yeah, this is the Mishnah. They're quoting the Mishnah, and now they're going into the Mishnah. This is just a quote from our Mishnah. So, bracha la pot, patar et And if you make a la parperet, lo patar et Okay, I'll write it like this, but you know what it means. Okay, it doesn't work. 
So there's two lines, right? The resha is going to be the first one. The pot exempts your parperet. And the seifa is your parperet doesn't exempt your pot. Remember, parperet is like an appetizer. And then come Beit Shammai. And the whole question is going to be, which one are they referring to? And what does Beit Shammai mean? How do we read Beit Shammai? Even for a masek dera. Now, we don't know even for a masek dera what, and what are we referring to? What? Uh, sorry, sorry. Af lo masek dera. Even not a masek dera. So we buy a So now they ask, Beit Shammai, a resha plige? Is he talking about the resha? O dilma a seifa plige? Or is he, dis- or is he um, arguing over the second line? De ka'amra tanakama. Okay, let's start with the resha. Tanakama says, Beracha la pat patarata properet. And then you'd have to assume, what does Tanakama say? Not only is it porter the properet, it's also porter, right? Everything, just like we've assumed until now. Also, masek dera. And then, if Beit Shammai says, ah, even not masek dera, what's he saying? Ah, to Beit Shammai lemeimar, he comes say, loma baya properet to lopatra lehu. Not only does your hamotzi not cover your appetizer, but ela afilu, that's why the af, Afilu masek dera, even a masek dera nami lo patrad also doesn't exempt, which is radical because that goes against what we've assumed that kind of hamotzi covers your a masek dera is like a kugel or a, right something with mizonot in it. So that's one option. Odilma asefa pligi, or maybe now it shouldn't bother us that pechamai goes against what we know is obvious because pechamai often has different approaches. Or is it going about the end? De katane berachala parperet lo patar tapat. Okay, so parperet doesn't exempt bread. Patu de lo patar avama sektera patar. So Tanakama says, well, it's not poter pat, but it is poter ma sektera. So if you imagine, right, you're at a wedding and you're at the smorgasbord and you eat something mizonot, that will cover any mizonot that you have during the meal later. Okay, assuming you don't wash. But it won't cover your bread that you're going to eat later. Va'atu bechama le meimar afilu ma sektera nami lo patar. And then bechama says, no. Your parperet, your first course is a whole separate thing. Any bracha you make there doesn't cover you for later. Okay, so those are the two options, and the Gemara answers teku. We don't know the answer. Okay, hayu yoshvin kolacha veechad. So now we discuss the difference between sitting and leaning. So the Gemara says it seems pretty obvious from the Mishnah. He sevu in lo sevu lo. Right, that if we're all reclining around the table, that means we're all together in the meal, and one can be motzi everybody else. But if we're just sitting, like on chairs, that's not going to count. Uriminhu, this seems to contradict the following source. There were 10 people walking. They were taking on a tiyu, let's say. We're now going to have two scenarios of people eating on a tiyu. Either one person brings the food for everybody, right? And we all share one loaf of bread. Even if we're all eating from the same loaf of bread, we're here, we're not in a tiyul, it's very arai, right? This is all about arai versus keva. Arai is, is temporary, keva is set and organized. So, even if everyone's eating from the same bread, everybody makes a bracha for themselves. But yashvu echol, if we all sit down to eat, now what would you expect from our Mishnah? Yashvu echol, that's not enough, you'd have to recline. Here it says, yashvu echol, afal pi shechol echad, ochel mi kikaro, even though we all take out our sandwiches from our teak, one covers everybody. Because as soon as we sit, that means we're eating together. So, katane yashvu, sevu. And this seems to contradict what we just said, right? They didn't need to recline here. So, amrav nacham bar yitzchak, kegon da amre, nez avanecha lachma beduch plan. It's, it would be a case where they said, let's go all eat in the following place. It's not like we just happen to all be around the table. I'm thinking of, you know, you go to a, a cafeteria and you sit down and I sit down and a bunch of us sit down. It's not like we really planned it. But if we said, we're all going to meet at the following place and sit to eat together, right? We're on a teal and we said, let's meet up at the tree and, you know, we're going to sit at this picnic table there. If we said that in advance, then it's as if we leaned. Okay? And this is why, right, one thing we do in our house at Havdala, we sit down at the table. Okay, a lot of people stand for Abdallah, but we sit down because there's this issue of kviut seuda. Okay, I'm not saying you have to do this, but of people, like, if you want to be kover for something, you have to be sitting together. So in those days, it was reclining, but again, it depends on the scenario. So sometimes there's people who, who happen to be here and they, and they stand up, and I was like, no, 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 sit down. Like, they're like, we stand for Abdallah. And, and my feeling is, no, no, we're being kover together. If you're going to stand and we're all sitting, well, then you're not really part of the, of the bracha, being yotze. So I, I couldn't remember where the source for it is. I, you can, I don't know, but there's a source for it about Havdalah and sitting. I don't remember where it is, but uh, maybe I'll find it at some point. Okay. 
Kinach nafshe de Rav. Now we have a great story. When Rav dies, Az, okay, this is a famous story because it was quoted, the Rav quoted it. Um, in a, in a, I forget now the context where he quotes it, but I'll tell you the, where he, what he meant, what he says about it. Kinach nafshe de Rav, Azlu tamidav batre. Okay, when Rav died, his students went like walking after the, the dead body, right? Like we do leave Oyamet. Ki hadre, when they came back, when they were finished with that, Amre, nezo venecho lachma anahar danak. Let's go eat bread at the Nahar Danak. So now notice what they said. They said, let's go all eat together at Nahar Danak. Batar de Karche, Yatve Vakamibayalu. So after they ate, they said, Hey Sevu Dafkatsnan of Al Yashvu Lo, Odilma Kevanda Amre, Nezo Venecho Rifta, Bidukla Planita, Ki He Sevu Dame. Right? They said, Ah, oh, wait a minute, halakha question. Is this like we're sitting together, right? Do we say like our Mishnah? Only if we recline and we're not reclining here, or is it that we decided we were all going to eat here, and therefore is that considered that one can make the bracha for everybody? So lo havu Okay, sorry. This is before they right as they're making their bracha on the bread. Right? Can one be mostly the rest of us? So they didn't know what to do. Here's the the line that Rav Soloveitchik quotes: Kam Rav Adabar Ahava Ahader Kare Laachore Bekara Kriya Achrina. Okay, he tears a new Kriya, basically. Okay, he says, wow, how sad that my rabbi is no longer around. Right? Amar, nach, nach she de Rav, he says, this is a painful statement, right? Rav dies. Ubircha mazona lo gamrinan. And we, ne- we forgot to ask him this halacha about Burkana mazona. He didn't teach us, right? It's this loss, this feeling, this terrible loss of not having him, right? That, oh my goodness, you know, what, what a missed opportunity. Right? How could we have not asked him this question? Well, the story has a happy ending. Ad, ad, right? You can imagine them all sitting here. Oh my, you know, Rav just died. Who are we going to go to? What are we going to do? Well, here appears ad, ad, saba, an old person, an elderly man appears. Rama He brings the Mishnah, the contradicted the Brayta that we just read, and says Vishanelu, and he teaches them plan. Right, this is a good scenario where we knew the answer before they did, right? Because we read, right, we read the Gemara. But he says, ah, he says, no, 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 I learned this. We brought the Mishnah that seems to say only Hesevu. We brought this Brayta which said these people were going on a path, and they did. One was mostly the other. And what do you, right? How do we resolve the contradiction? Ah, do if you say we're going to eat in this specific place, it's like your Hesevu, and therefore one would make a bracha for everybody, and all ended well. But still, you know, the loss of their rabbi, I'm sure they still felt for. You know, especially Rav, who was such a big tummy chacham, and all the questions that they didn't get to ask him. And they all said that the Seva is Eliyahu. Ah, right. So I was thinking that as I was telling the story, right? It, it kind of, it seems to indicate it's like an Eliyahu type character, you know, that shows up, appears all of a and sudden. The right, right. And Ahu Saba is sometimes a reference to Eliyahu. So it's definitely, you know, a possibility that that's what the story is telling us, you know, that there's this savior that kind of comes in to save you. But, you know, it's also after you feel the loss. It's, it's almost, it goes back to that other thing that I said it before we ended that section before the Mishnah about that, you know, so you have to feel the loss, you have to feel God. It's all about, Right, recognizing things that are beyond what you're seeing in the here and now, and, and realize what, what what's not there, like the loss of the rabbi, or you don't, you know, God's not here physically, but to see something that's not exactly there in front of you.